Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Payson here with Monique Scott and Joel Elston, and this is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today, especially since Joel is back and he gets to meet Monique, and I get to talk with Joel, and I get to talk with Monique. This is a good day. This is a yes, really good day. Loving this. So, Monique, what do you think? I mean, you just met Joel. You want to hear some stuff from Joel? I mean, he's a pretty cool guy, I have to say. Definitely. Definitely. I'm ready. I'm all ears. All right. Here we Bye. go. So, how's it going there, Joel? What's happening? Things are really good. Uh, we're, I'm in central Virginia. We have, a, we're having just an incredible day. Bright sun, about 50 degrees. It's, uh, uh, a little sign of spring here. So it's wonderful right here. Beautiful. I'm nice. Yeah. And, uh, this is actually a good opportunity for me to let people know, um, the LOA Today app is now updated and it includes, like I've been promising now for a few weeks, it includes a complete insertion of the book, Your Daily Dose of Happy Real Success Stories of the Law of Attraction, which we did back in 2018. And uh, Joel actually had a submission in that book, too. You'll remember you you submitted the the Marcus story um, to that particular one. And uh, uh, this is kind of my way of segueing over to that. But uh, before I segue over, I just want to let people know it is now out on both the iPhone and on the Android phones. And... uh, so you, you, you can get it both of those ways. It's been out there for a few days now on both PCs and Macs. So whatever platform you're using, make sure you have the latest version. It's going to be at least 1.2.0, I believe, is, is the minimal version. 1.2.1 is the one you really want. And uh, check it out. It's, it's 55 manifestation stories, and most of them are written by law of attraction coaches and life coaches and so forth. And really, really cool, interesting stories from a wide variety of perspectives. So check it out. Check out Joel's story, too. Um, and I'm, I'm going to kind of call on you, Joel, because we haven't talked about Marcus for a few years now. And I was just wondering, can you give us like an update? Well, first, give people an idea of what the story is, because a lot of our listeners haven't heard the story. And, you know, what's what's been going on with this guy? Well, uh, I'll tell the story and then sort of update where we're at. Okay. Uh, Marcus is, uh, is, is a young man I met, and that is not his real name, so no one needs to worry. Right. Uh, I met him in my practice. He was in foster care, and um, he had been to every therapist in, in town, and, and the I know the social worker that was in charge of his case. And he, just an outstanding young man. She could see his, his strength. And no one was able to really get through to him. He had a really bad backstory. His mother had died when he was in foster care. Uh, he, you know, he was eight years old. Uh, he had no other family. So he, he just got put into the system. And he, when I, when I sat down with him the very first time, I, I asked him to, uh, you know, he, you know, I, I, I agreed to meet with him and, and those, unfortunately, those cases aren't, my services aren't covered in those cases. So that's pro bono work. And I do that quite a bit, but I, I, I I, I sat down with him and, and he was expecting, you know, the typical therapy response. And so I, I was asking, so what do you like to do? And, and, and he's like, well, he said, I'm, I'm oppositionally defiant. I'm depressed. And I'm like, well, no, no. What, what do you like to do? And he's like, well, I'm on these medications. And, and I'm like, you're not answering my, what do you like to do? I, I don't understand. Right. And, and, and he was, uh, he, he was baffled by my question. He said, I, I, I don't know what you mean. I said, what is fun to you? And he didn't really, all he could come up with was stuff. So I, I said, okay, well, tell me about your medications. And he said, uh, uh, I'm on, he was on, I think, I forget the number, but it was an astronomical number. I'd have to go back to my file, but it was, it was something like 12 medications he was on or something of like that and, you know, psychotropic medications. And, and the first one he started with was Prozac and he went through the list and, um, and so I said, well, why are you on Prozac? And, and he says, well, I'm depressed. And I said, okay. And, um, I saw him, I just started with Prozac and I, and this young man was very bright, but in the beginning, he, he, he had been so used to traditional therapy that he, he was answering almost as anticipated as everybody always asked, as everybody had asked before. So I, I said, well, tell me about Prozac. And, and he says, well, it's because I'm depressed. And my obvious question was, well, why, why are you depressed? And he was getting really frustrated because of the process that I was doing with him. I was, I just kept asking questions. He said, well, I'm depressed because I'm in foster care and my mom died. And I said, well, that, I mean, being depressed makes sense for being in foster I said, but what does Prozac do? And he goes, well, it, they say it helps with some brain chemicals. And I said, okay. 
And uh, so we kept, and so I, let, I sort of let him walk himself into the trap of, or the the, the, the awakening. And I said, so it helps with brain chemicals. So I said, but I'm just confused. And he was, he, that's when he's really getting frustrated. I said, I don't understand how you, you, you say your depression is because your mom died in your foster care, which you, is completely what you should be. You should be depressed. It's, that's what happens. Um, but I'm understanding how Prozac is helping your mom not be dead and you not be in foster care. And his little brain started looking and then we went through all these medications and, and, and I slowly got him to understand that he was listening to what everybody else was saying. His mom had died, horrible scenario. Uh, he was put in foster care. They, they tried to keep, you know, he was very upset. They told him he was oppositionally defiant. He was depressed. He was ADD. And I forget all the other labels he had had. Uh, and he literally was behaving exactly as each one was described to him. He, he was oppositionally defiant. He was depressed. He was, uh, uh, I forget that. Op- there was another one, intermittent explosive disorder. And I just see the weird diagnosis that clearly didn't fit this kid. Right. And so as we, as I got really strong in my conversation with him, really, he started understanding where we're going. I explained to him that, that he had developed an internal dialogue that was built on years of being told these things. And at the time, even though he was eight in foster care, I believe at the time he was 11 or 12 when I was seeing him. So I said, you know, three years of you being basically brainwashed. And I said, so you're literally living up to the diagnosis you've been given. And, and, and he, and he, he just was so into the process. And so I said, your choice, do it, you, are you want to keep doing this? You want to, and, and, and he instantly, he's somebody that, that just instantly recognized that to be the truth. And he said, I said, so all of this is in your control. And, and he went to his teacher the next day, true story, and told his teacher he was no longer oppositionally defiant. He went, asked to be moved to the front of the class. He apologized to his foster care mother uh, for his behavior and said he would no longer act out that way, uh, that he had been t- given some bad information. And he said he needed an appointment with a psychiatrist as soon as possible because he needed to get off of all of this medication. And he instantly, would literally within a very short period of time, changed his whole perspective of himself. Uh, his, his grades increased. I mean, it was, it was, he has to be moved up into the front of the class so he could pay attention and not be distracted. He became a leader in his foster care home. Uh, multi, everything happened. So, uh, probably two years after that, two or three years, that was about 14. I got a text from him that, you know, he was, he'd been chosen by a family to be adopted and, he, he was so ecstatic and, and I wasn't able to go to the adoption, but I was, I was able to go with closed circuit and I was able to see him and he was thriving. And that's probably been two or three years now. He's about to graduate high school and he has been accepted to, uh, uh, the University of South Carolina. So this is a kid that there was nothing wrong with him, but his programming. And the law of attraction of his programming literally gave him everything he was attracted. And, you know, you feel, I feel sorry for him, but at the same time, once he realized I'm in control of this, my perspective dictates my reality. I mean, he, he said that over and over. He, he claims he's about, he's going to get that as his tattoo. My perspective dictates my reality. So, <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, but he is, he is this amazing young man that everyone that meets him is very much in tune with just just how powerful he is with the law of attraction. He, he, he is really into this process. He ultimately wants to be, uh, sort of do what I do. He's, he's taking psychology classes now, but very much into the law of attraction concept as, as applied to psychology using the positive psychology model. And, and, and he know and he, he testifies to how much it's changed. He said it, he's off all medication. Uh, he was on a small dose of, uh, Ritalin for a little while. Cause he does have ADD, but we, he learned how to manage that without the Ritalin. Uh, he's very anti-medication on any level. So it is this, this incredible success story that just continues to grow. He's, he's probably one of the most positive young people I've ever met. Um, he, he, his grades are, he has a 3.6. He has some honor classes in there. And this is a throwaway kid that society mm-hmm. basically if if he would have followed the stereotypical route, he never would have been adopted because of his behavior. He would have gone. He, the moment he turned eighteen, he basically had been put on the streets. Within a year, he had ended up in prison, and and that that's the system 
and that that lives of these kids and all that he changed and all that he changed. I mean, the, the thing <laughs> that changed him the most, the, the most important thing, he literally changed how he thought about himself. Walt and I have had this discussion for multiple years. I find the younger people are, the more easily they can accept the concept of the law of attraction and apply them because they don't have the 50 years of baggage most of us have the, right. of telling them otherwise. It, it, him at 12 just realized, huh, I'm in charge of this. And he snapped his fingers and changed his life, and literally. And I, I just uh, I admire him so much. Uh, we remain very close. Uh he, he just, he's just a pleasure to talk to. I mean, we're, we're friends on, on, uh, you know, uh, social media and I get texts from him frequently. He's got a girlfriend. Uh, he, he lifts weights. I mean, this is a kid that anybody would be grateful to have and in, in their life. And he, he's going to be a blessing. He'll change some lives and it all changed when he decided to change his perspective. Perspective. It was that simple. How's that, Monique? <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. And so easy, so easy to believe. And I tend to agree with you, Joel, because um, I personally had a client and that, that was a lot of her struggle. Um, while you and I have talked about this, you know, from her um, Catholic background and just trying to get or unprogram or reprogram, you know, her mind to accept the concept of the law of attraction. She wanted to, but kind of like what you said, you know, she's got 30, 40 years of programming that now she has to unprogram just to try to believe that things are possible for her or that she can change. It's and, and Monique, you're, 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 you're so on point because uh, I, I share this all the time, so it's probably even repetitive from my last session. But you know, our, 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 and I apologize ahead of time. I do that a lot. But our subconscious brain operates at about forty million bytes per second. Our conscious brain is only about forty thousand bytes per second. Mm-hmm. Thirty years, forty years of programming of your subconscious brain that you do not have direct access to is where that comes from. So as much as her core beliefs that she, you know, that Catholic, that guilt, all that, you know, recovering, you know, all that, all that stuff that comes mm-hmm. with, with a lot of religions. I, I personally am a recovering Southern Baptist. I always tell people, um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, yes, I, I, Me I, too. I, wow, that, that was a lot of reprogramming. Uh, but it sure you know, was. The, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but once, once your client, you know, gets to a place or gets, you know, the, the, Access to the subconscious only comes through repetitive, you know, self-talk and getting there where you're like, like the young man, you know, Marcus, uh, he, you know, he didn't have 12 years of only had 12 years of, of, you know, programming and really four years of bad programming and, and sort of the science behind it up until seven years old, you're basically in sort of in a trance like state anyway. So really he only had about four or five years of, of really negative programming. That once he was able to let it go, he had a really quick shortcut. Your client had 40 years and had it reinforced and, and the law of attraction, because we do get what we expect to get. Yes. Not only did she have the programming, she also had proof in her mind. See, this always goes wrong. This always happens. And, do you and, know her and personally? So, because I swear. I, 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 <laughs> that I, was I, I do. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I do just only because I, I, every one of my clients is her. Uh, right. but, but, th- but you're, you're so on, th- and that's the exciting piece to me is <laughs> when you can get to that place where you start reprogramming, then the instant results that, you know, that's just how it happened in my life is, is yeah. once I started realizing, wow, you know, I'm sort of in control of all this. And the more I believed that, the more it became, and, and it just, it just took over. And, and right now it's not even a, it's on autopilot. My, my subconscious is caught up with my conscious. Right, because now it becomes a lifestyle because we've done it for so long. Yes, yes, and it it never failed. It just never failed me, and I, I, I just watching people sort of use this sort of getting out of the the sort of that victim mindset of 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 what you know the the the, the rehearsed narratives that that keep us stuck. And yeah. you know, Walt and I used to always joke when we would have input from listeners. There were, there were always two factors. There was either how can I get a better relationship or how can I get more money? Those were almost always the two yeah. things that people had. Now, ironically, we had one young man that was awesome that I forget his name. This has been a couple of years ago. He, 
he, he started doing law of attraction. He said, Hey, Walt, Joel, we're, I'm doing a great job with it. Uh, however, I came in because I wanted to get more money. Uh, the rest of my life's going great, but I still don't have more money. Well, his focus was on the no, having no money when the rest of it, he just sort of like lit everything on the other side, other things getting better. So you, you see, you see how people always are, are, they want it, but it, the hard part to explain is wanting it too much takes you all the way back around where, where you're, you're, you're really looking at having the lack of it. And I, I don't know you very well, Monique, uh, or know you at all, but I fact we, I can connect with where I, we, I get you. I'm very much law of attraction based with Abraham Hicks. Uh, you know, you know, Mike Dooley's one of my big guys. So, so I, I tend to, you know, I, while I don't follow any of them exactly, exactly literally, I, I, I tend to be influenced both by Abraham Hicks and, you know, what you think is, is, is your reality, period. That's it. I completely, completely agree. And uh, Walt, I hope that we're not like ho- hogging the conversation from you or anything. I, I am encouraging okay. this. I'm loving the fact oh, okay. that you guys are going. This is great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What I have found, um, uh, by the way, I just, I just want to say one thing. I, I wondered how long it would take for the two of you to realize that you were both ex Southern Baptists. It took <laughs> 10 minutes. It didn't take all that long. Not long. long. <laughs> <laughs> Not long right. at all. But Joel, you know, what I found with my clients in terms of manifesting money is a lot of people don't really realize these negative, um, money narratives, if you will, these money negative stories that they've been repeating and saying to themselves, over and over again, especially if you grew up in a household where there wasn't a lot of money or you always heard your parents say stuff like um, money doesn't grow on trees or we can't afford that or that's too expensive or what do you think I'm made of money, that kind of stuff. And what they don't realize is hearing that as a child over and over and over again, it gets programmed and then they start to say it to themselves. So some of my clients, um, I remember one client, she could easily easily afford a four-figure skyrise apartment that she wanted right but in her mind she kept telling us i can't afford that i can't afford that i can't afford that i'm like are you kidding me you're doing seventy-seven thousand dollar months and you can't afford it <laughs> what are you talking about that's crazy right Bye. but Bye. she had to reprogram her mind around money because she literally felt like she could not afford it even though what she saw in her bank account said otherwise that negative programming concerning money was holding her back from really being able to scale her business beyond that she she was much more capable of doing way more than that but sure you know it, 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 it that that is that is one of the one of my other stories and and and, and i actually my son and i years ago uh he wanted to stop at a McDonald's and mm-hmm. I never go to McDonald's. I hate McDonald's, but, uh, it, it, yeah. it, yeah, yeah. But, uh, the young man behind the counter, I drove up in a Porsche. And uh-huh. so the young man in the, behind the counter, very uh, nice young man. And, and, uh, we started a dialogue. He saw what I drove up in. And he said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a life coach. And, uh, mm-hmm. oh, wow. And I said, and, but I could tell how, I mean, he really enjoyed talking. So well, what are you going to do? He said, well, I've just graduated high school and, and I'm going to get into the McDonald's management training program. I've been invited to do that. I'm really excited about that. And I said, that's great. I said, have you thought about doing anything else? And he was, uh, you know, he, he was an African American young man that had, you know, super, super kid. I was just, you could just, that energy was right there. And I said, well, you know, as we got our food, I said, here's my car. If you ever wanted to talk about anything or advice, I might have some ideas. He goes, what do you mean? I said, just put it in your wallet. Call me if you want to. So about a week later, he calls me and he says, I don't know what you were talking about. I said, well, look, I said, I, I want you to, you know, nothing's wrong with McDonald's, but why don't you maybe look out there what's better? I said, there's, there's, what did you like in school? And, and so we go through this whole process and do sort of an evaluation. With and he loves science. And I said, well, you know, there's a program that would really match you. I said that you could go to school for free. It's a six month certification, nine month certification. You become an x-ray technician. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what? And I said, well, yeah, just call the, I had the name contacted lady, just call her. And he said, well, 
I, I don't have any money. I said, well, it's free. You're missing the free part. It, they'll train you. And I said, about halfway through the program, the hospital will hire you for your sort of your internship. And they pay like $20 an hour. And he's like, that's more than I make it a lot more than I'll be making to me. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, I, 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 and he said, I, he said, but what are you charging me? I go, I'm not charging anything. I just want you to just do that. Right. He, he couldn't believe this was that easy. So about two hours later, his mother calls and goes off on me. She said, what the hell are you telling me about to my son? You know, <laughs> he's the first one to graduate high school. He's the one that, that is going to take, and he's got this opportunity to McDonald's. You're trying to, you know, what do you want from him? I said, ma'am, I don't want anything from him. I'm just telling you there's an opportunity. And she said, you want something. Nobody does this for free. You want something from him. Wow. I said, no, no, I don't. She said, she said I, if he runs this opportunity at McDonald's because you put these big ideas in his head. And so anyway, mm. we, I calmed her down a little bit. And um, <laughs> I said, well, just, yeah, not even, I said, I, and I explained, I said, you have generational poverty. I said, I'm not trying to be negative. But you believe this is all he can do. And I see this incredible kid that can do whatever he wants to do. And we just see him differently. Mine comes from a different perspective. But you don't have to. He doesn't have to call these people. Just call. So anyway, the kid calls. Is accepted immediately. He thrives in the program. Just just can't believe that they're paying him to go to school at some point. He gets, <laughs> it, it, it's just he, he's loving it. He's. In his internship, he starts working at the hospital. So there's this doctor that he meets that just loves this kid. He's an old white dude. So, I mean, just, just like he just loves this kid. He's like, yeah, this is it. And so they become really close. The doctor hires him after he gets the certification to do the x-rays at his private office. And, and in addition to working at the hospital, so this kid starts making about 80 grand a year and about doing really well. And the best part of the story where, where it gets just almost unbelievable is this, this doctor is an older doctor. He has no kids. He has a very big practice. And so in the, all the families became very close. Like they spend holidays together. And so that, you know, you, this is, I was telling the story over a period of years, but. On Christmas, I think of 2017, maybe they were over there and the doctor and his wife tells the young man and his mom, so we have a gift for you and is an envelope. He said, we, he's an alumni for the University of Texas. He said, we're going to send you to college to be a medical doctor and your job is going to be to take over my practice when you're done. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. It, it, and, and, and the mom has become one of my biggest supporters, apologizes almost every time we talk. She, she went back to school and is a nurse. Wow. So, so th- this is, this is generational reversing of property. Yeah. Yeah. But, my, but my point is, like you're talking about that dialogue that Monique was talking about mm-hmm. of going it's just instilled sometimes in cultures or, or just generational, you know, I, I grew up in a family of a lot of addiction and a lot of uh, lower middle class dysfunction. And and I mean that with just, just the, always feeling like you were the victim of everything. Like the man got, you know, if you have any money, you're lucky or any of that stuff. And, and that reprogramming, I mean, my mom, I love her. She's passed away and, and, you know, but she was the most anxious woman about like money and fear. She, she struggled with money her entire life. Even my dad, who did very well, her anxiety over money eventually overrode his sort of, you know, mindset. It, it's, it's incredible to watch that happen over time. She, she really attracted a lack of money in her life, her entire life. And it was really sad to, to watch. It, it really was. And, and I had to break away from all of those things. And, and I don't have a lack of money anymore. I have an abundance and continue to have an abundance and, and have unlimited. I, I, I can't, you know, can't be any more busy than I am now. I have a great career. And it all changed <laughs> by reprogramming all this stuff, just like you're talking about. And it's not easy. And when, when we say that's all there is to it, that's a lot harder than, than that right. is all there is to it. Yeah. Right. Interesting, yeah. interesting thing I got to share too. In the live stream, we, we got people listening in the live stream. One of them is named Rebecca and she was asking about your background, Joel. She wanted to know 
um, if you were a therapist. And I said, well, he, he was a licensed therapist. He's since kind of transitioned over to being a life coach. And she says, well, as a therapist myself, that's something that resonates with me. And she says she's also an Abraham Hicks LOA believer. So she's just blown away that she found this podcast today. <laughs> I just wow. had to let you guys know that. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, and I'm glad she's listening. Uh, one of the, one of the things that I found with traditional therapy, and this is my opinion, uh, so much training in traditional therapy. First of all, there was limitations and, and the, the, you know, if it, you're licensed to do that, you have sort of a, a boundary that you can work within. And uh, I realized a lot of my thoughts of law of attraction was directly opposed to my training in therapy. And, and so I, I certainly am not upset with anybody who's a therapist. I think there's certainly a place for that, but a lot of, a, a lot of traditional therapy has become so trauma based and I and I agree trauma is a big factor in all of this but but you can be stuck in trauma and uh I, I know some of the models basically they they never work toward getting out of trauma and and so it, it's this law of attraction sort of offers I, I forget which one but one of the um the law, Abraham Hicks book she you know that she literally talks about childhood trauma and and they and they said well does it matter and she said if you want it to matter I mean, it, 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 it matter. It, you know, and, and I know that rubs traditional therapists the just really raw oh, yeah. when, when you do that. And I, and I'm, I know by no means do I ever minimalize someone's trauma, but I also accept there needs to be a period behind that at some point in your life with a new, with a new start over versus a comma constantly behind that trauma description and, and how it's affecting. We, you know, no matter where you're from, your background, your disability, who your parents were, no matter, no matter what the scenario, your color, your wherever, the law of attraction is completely fair. It works equally with everyone and it, 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 it has no bias. And see exactly what he's talking about, Walt. Lynn's, he's talking about me. Around he's talking about rape. all of us. <laughs> yeah, but particularly around my rape. Remember, you know, oh yeah, oh. being able to forgive Kevin and moving right. on and deciding that it, it's going to make me better and not bitter. That's exact, exactly what he's talking about. I decided. So, you know, I know you're just now meeting me, Joe, but I, I shared a couple, I think maybe on my very first um, podcast here episode, Walt and I talked about me being raped when I was 15 and having the ability to forgive Kevin, the guy who did it and just moving on with my life, you know, not allowing that trauma to affect me negatively to where I never wanted to be in a relationship or I didn't want to have sex or, you know, I hated men or whatever could have come out of that. So just exactly what you're saying. It really depends on you. You get, you get to decide. And I think that that's where a lot of people get hung up because the concept of understanding that you create your own reality, right? The law of attraction, like you said, Joel, it works whether you believe in it or not. Just like gravity, Absolutely. you throw something yep. up, it's coming down. <laughs> you don't Walt, have to believe it, it's going to happen. Walt and I right? probably have said that every episode we've Just ever about. done. Just <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's so true. So, I mean, just to your point, I'm I'm a I'm an example of exactly what you're saying. You and congratulations, by the way. But what Thank you. I, 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 I'm sorry that horrible experience happened, but I'm so impressed that there's a book by a late a professor named Carol Dweck. It's called mm -hmm. Growth Mindset. Your mm -hmm. response to your rape was a growth mindset. You you it, it uh, trauma or events like that have a tendency to either defeat you or, or propel you. Right. And you, and you don't realize you're in charge of that. You chose to be propelled. There will no, you'll never hear my words. If I could beat his ass for you, I would, I promise you. But, <laughs> I, but, <Thank> you. <laughs> but, but, but let me tell you, I don't give him, the, you didn't give him the power to affect your life. You no. took that away from him and you took back your life. I have huge, huge respect for that, Monique. Thank seriously. You. Thank yeah. you. By the way, Rebecca is uh, jumping in saying, oh, my God, thank you for sharing your thoughts on the field. She's just, like, blown away by what you guys are saying. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome, Rebecca. This is the kind of thing I think that needs to be heard more often. That's yeah. one of the reasons why we do this podcast. You know, I, I think what happens is we kind of get all humans, regardless of what our field is, what, you know, how we, where our expertise is, how we spend our time and so forth, we all kind of 
we, we have we, we acquire beliefs and thoughts and understandings that kind of run counter to what society accepts. And so we're often reluctant to you know cross lines and you know risk offending people and so forth. I, that's one of the reasons I love doing this show because we don't worry too much about those lines. We just simply tell our truths right. the way we know them. And one of the reasons I've organized it so that I have so many co-hosts is I get so many great perspectives that way. But I mean, I was just sitting back listening to you guys go back and forth about this. And then Rebecca comes on. I'm thinking, wow, this is really great. This is powerful. This is excellent. Yeah, it is. So it truly is. <laughs> one thing I wanted to ask both of you guys from your uh, experience as people who grew up in Southern Baptist, Joel described himself as recovering Southern Baptist. Um, <laughs> and and you, you've described to me, Monique, about um, how you've kind of created sort of an uh, amalgamated version of what you used to believe. You kind of uh, tied in what your current beliefs are and you've created your own, you've created your own religion. That's the best way I can think of to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I guess, uh, I guess my question is if you, are coming from a background like that, which, I mean, I, I certainly have my own uh, experience. I was brought up in a Presbyterian church, but, you know, certainly my own uh, things that I rejected and so forth and, and challenges I went through in my mind. But as you leave stuff behind and you take on new beliefs and you're dealing with all of the pressures that are involved in that, because there, there are expectations from family, from society and so forth, if, if you're talking to somebody else who may be going through the same thing, how do you advise them to go through something like that? How do you advise them to make that transition? Because, I mean, I had nobody to talk to about it. I mean, my parents were very much pillars of the church, so I couldn't really talk to them about it. There was, mm-hmm. At the time, nobody even knew that it was a thing to talk about, so I didn't have anybody to even talk about. But if somebody had talked to me, I'm not even sure what I would have asked them. I mean, how do you how do you help somebody through that? You want to go? Let me, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Monique, and I'll listen to you and I'll respond. Okay. Well, for me personally, um, what I try to get people to understand is, in my opinion, is that when it comes to religion or religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, I believe that the pastor, your minister, whatever they're called, wherever you are, right? He is teaching the Bible, and I'm just going to talk about the Bible from a Christian point, right? He's teaching the Bible, right? But if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, my belief is I tell people, yes, they're teaching you the Bible. However, that's their interpretation. You get to read it for yourself. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or God or Holy Spirit or whatever you believe, right? It's a personal relationship for a reason. I believe it is our duty to go within, to find God within, to connect with God within, to get that guidance. Not for me to have the pastor tell me his interpretation of the Bible. Now I know that that's his job. That's what he's supposed to do. And I get that. But in my opinion, that's his version. I get to decide what my life looks like. And I tell people, you do not have to care what other people think. You do not. Yes, I understand that's your mom, your dad, your siblings, whatever, right? And I'm definitely not saying don't be respectful towards them. Absolutely not. However, this life is your own and it's all you've got. I know for me, I would tell my clients, some of the decisions that I made, my mom wasn't happy with, but my mom also wasn't living my life either. She lived her life. She decided to get married. She decided to have kids. She decided whatever. It was okay for Marie, but Monique has her own life and I get to decide. And just because she wasn't happy with it didn't mean I wasn't going to do it. It just means she wasn't happy with it, right? Right. So that's kind of the perspective that I've come come towards with my clients, just reminding them that everything is your own decision. And just because that's what the pastor says it is, you need to find that out for yourself. Don't be afraid to go to God for yourself and have your own personal relationship and see what the Holy Spirit or God or spirit, infinite intelligence, source, energy, whatever you call he, she, or it See what it's saying to you about 
how you're living your life or the things that you want to do and look for that guidance from him directly. I, I tell them you don't have to, if that doesn't resonate with your spirit, you literally don't have to take it. <laughs> and so it's, it was no longer resonating with my spirit and I no longer took it. Oh, all right. I like that. And, and, and I'm a lot of, I went through the, a huge struggle uh, at a young age, I remember being, you know, my family was in church every, every Sunday, I was yep. in Sunday school. Yep. And I, I remember just, I, I was really, I would ask the questions like, how did the penguins get on the ark? Um, <laughs> you know, and, 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 yeah, and, and stuff that just made absolutely no sense. Uh, I kept saying that this, I'm sorry, I just can't, I, but instinctively, sincerely, I knew there was something. I felt right. an energy. I felt a presence, but the story they were telling me just didn't add up. I mean, I, I tried to talk to my mom and I tried to talk to the preacher and I was told that Satan was interfering and you know, all this other stuff. And it, it just, I mean, I go, no, I'm not buying that either. I mean, I, right. and, and I, I was, so while I, I have a huge belief in God, I, I, the whole structure of religion, now that I sort of see it is, you know, there, there's a lot of profit. There's a whole industry of religion. There's, yeah. And again, I'm not, and, and everybody does what everybody wants to do. I'm good right. with all that, but there, there is something that goes full circle with me. When I was struggling, I just kept instinctively knowing there was something there. And I, I mean, I was asking everybody, I even went to my, my hometown library, just trying to look up spiritual books. Well, again, a Southern Baptist town in Florida is not going to have anything. Uh, you know, the spiritual book they have is just two different versions of the Bible. You know, where, <laughs> right. right. The, 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 the modern version of the King James. That's it. That's right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and ironically, this is the time where Seth Speaks, Jane Robert, uh, Jane's book, Seth Speaks was huge. It came out. It, and I remember asking my mom, I said, there's got to be more. And she said, there's nothing else. And your search for it is what's going to send you to hell. And, um, and so I'm like, okay, well, probably don't want to do that path. <laughs> um, so, you know, with your own family and your, your preachers yeah. that you're going to, so I, I then as life went on, I went through my struggles. And again, I, I instinctively knew there was a God, but then when I sort of my introduction to law of attraction was the secret, I've talked to Walt about that a bunch, which led me to a bunch of other studies. I've, and I've read all this Jane Roberts stuff, Seth's material. Oh, and okay. yeah, it really opened my eyes to, wow, I, I, I just started seeing things differently. So without getting into what my specific, you know, I, but I believe that helping other people just as exactly what Mogik said. It, to me, part of our journey on this planet is to discover that. Right. And so I, I, Monique, you don't probably don't know me this about me. I, I've adopted children and my, my youngest son is now 15. I adopted him five years ago when he was 10. Mm -hmm. And he, one day early in the adoption, when he's living with me, because what is our religion? I go, I don't know what yours is, but you know, I, I'm a little of this, a little of that. And um, I said, but I, I want you to ask me all the questions you want. You have access to everything. And then you tell me what you believe, then I'll finally tell you what I believe. But I don't want to influence. I want you to get to that journey. Right. right. And so one day I get a call from the school. And again, we live in, I live in a sort of a rural area of Hanover, but it's called Hanover right outside of Richmond. And um, the, the lady was really nice. She said, uh, I see that you and Justin are Buddhist. <laughs> and, um, and I'm like, <laughs> what? And I just went, I, I'm like, I'm like, yes, yes, we are. And, uh, um, <laughs> and, and, and she said, well, I didn't know, do we have any like food restriction? I said, no, we're good. We're, we're just, we're fine. So I laughed and I went, Justin, I said, so we were Buddhist. And he goes, I am. I don't know about you, but it was <laughs> hilarious. So, <laughs> and, and and so you know i've encouraged him i've since shared my time and believe it or not a lot of the buddhist thought is exactly what i believe it goes a lot yeah. of a lot it matches law of attraction a lot of ways mm -hmm. so my point is i always try to just like you're saying many just try to this is your search mm -hmm. it is you know god didn't put us here to just accept blindly the fact that, you know, every 12 year old boy who masturbates is going to burn in hell. I'm finding right. a really hard time believing that. That's just not something that I'm, I'm going to get, you know, on board behind. 
right. um, you know, or, or somebody born into the country that never hears the message in a specific way and they're going to burn in hell for that. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't match. And, yeah. you know, so when I, I got to my awakenings and I, I, I sort of, and, and I always, I'm still open. I still like to learn. I still study different philosophies and religion. So, you know, I, I, I factually know there's a God and I have a sort of an evolving, I've created in a, in a, my own way, sort of my own religion yeah. and, and I can break it up, you know, 72% Buddhist. I'm this, I'm this, but I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm very comfortable with mine. And when you're dealing with people who are like my mother would say, before she passed away, she would be like, we had a really good conversation about six months before she passed away. And she said, I'm really, there's a way she started. She said, I really am worried that you're going to burn in hell. That was her conversation. And I said, mom, I said, I, I know you are. And I said, I, I, I don't believe you're going to. And I, I'm very comfortable with mine. I just ask you to give me the honor of, of not dismissing the journey that I've been on to come to what I've come to. Mm-hmm. I am not putting down your religion. Right. And I'm asking that you accept my spiritual practices are right for me. And I'm willing to deal with any consequences that may come my way. But I wish we could put that behind us because this is too much of a topic between us. I want to move mm-hmm. past that. Mm-hmm. And and we came to that the last six months of her life. We never discussed it again, which is really good. Nice. Especially considering what kind of a warrior your, your mom was. I mean, you touched on that, but we've oh, talked about yeah. that before. And, and she was she was a world champion. Let's be perfectly honest. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. She was relentless, and, and she believed all her heart. I mean, and, and fully and and blindly, and and mm-hmm. to, to the most fundamental side of it. And 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 um, at the same time, she was able, giving her great credit toward the end, she was able to accept. That while we we strongly disagree on probably ninety percent of what she believed, uh, that that nonetheless she could see the changes in my life. She and she certainly said, she said, well, you know, I'll be honest with you. She said, I never would say this to anyone, but what's going on in your life? Something's working, so mm-hmm. got to give you a little credit there. And <laughs> <laughs> considering the journey you've been on, yeah, on. I, I mean, she, yeah. it basically was laid out for her in black and white just seeing what you went through because she knew perfectly well what you went through and you went through you Absolutely. went you, you actually did go through hell actually yeah. you just was yeah. hell on yeah. earth and yeah. Yeah. and yet you the way you came out i mean it's it's impossible to argue with the result that's right. that's the thing how do you argue with the result you can't and, well you can try but, you know you can try yeah and yeah. and again I, I i i'll tell people when i start this journey with them and coaching you know, as we look at those areas, cause I, I, I start with, you know, the law of attraction doesn't require any change in religious belief. There's parts of the Bible that discuss, you know, believe, you know, faith of a mustard seed, you know, you can move a mountain. There, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of, is it one of the books that was removed from the Bible? I think it was the uh, gospel of Thomas yeah. is basically mm-hmm. a law of attraction book. It, yeah. it, that's that's all, it is. all it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it literally is like, you know, and, and Thomas's claim was that this is the conversations him and Jesus had sort of privately. And, um, of course that didn't match the narrative. You're going to burn in hell unless you do this. And you know, so that we had to take that out of the Bible. But mm-hmm. it, I, I, in, in Seth speak, she also refers to, or Seth actually says that Jesus existed. But if, for example, in the Lord's Supper, he was trying to demonstrate that by this is me. Your the the bread you're eating is me. If you are God, God is within you. I'm not the savior. The bread is all of us. We're all God. God right. is internal. That was the message. That doesn't work out to a very good religion when you don't have you know doesn't make a lot of money. So they had to no. adjust that a little bit, you know. But but <laughs> Seth claimed that that's exactly what Jesus and Buddha and Allah were all trying to teach in different ways. And I completely agree with that. That just kind of goes back to the conversation that you and I had, um, what is it, last week or the week before? Well, when I was saying, you know, God is within us. It, we all are God. I believe that every human being, every creature, everything on earth that's ever been created by God, whether we know it exists or not, we're all just little pieces of God. And that's it. Because we're all that's him. It. Just just him manifested in a physical in different physical forms whether that's water whether that's air the moon whatever right and monique something that that always resonates with when i when i meet again we met what 45 minutes ago yes. um, 
but we already know each other like we've known each other for 20 years. So, I know. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when you meet, and, and when you meet people who have all been on, we have incredibly different backgrounds. We come from very different places. We, we, we have many different experiences, but we all, you and I end up at the same place basically. And yeah. when I meet people, I, you know, the, you know, Marcus, that, you know, kid that I met when he was 11 years old, people from all different backgrounds, we all end up at the same place. We, we come to the same beliefs. Mm-hmm. I find that the most, you know, I understand when you're born into a certain religion and you spend the rest of your life there, that makes sense. But for so many people to sort of get on, when I sort of describe what I believe and people, oh my God, I basically believe that too. When you come to it yourself on, and almost have that awakening where you, I, I, and not to upset anyone, I sincerely believe what I believe. I mean, I, it's in the bottom of my heart. I know it's there. I, 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 you know, I have had, I lost a son, uh, when he was, uh, 23 in a car accident. And I have had conversations with him since then and reinforcing exactly what I believe. So I, I am very comfortable with me. I don't need to defend it, right. nor do I, do I try to force it on anyone. But I think it, just your, your best advice as going back to Walt's question is, Everybody has to get to this on their own terms. It's like the, with the law of attraction, the, it, the, everybody along the way, this is the, the, the funny part. We all get to the same place. When you first hear it, you're like, I believe that completely, except how could a child in, invite into, then you get into how kids could attract all the, and then you get distracted on, you know, no kid would ever ask to be raped, but, right. but everybody sort of comes along the same way before you believe it. And mm-hmm. you have to sort of, so to me, it's a reinforcer. Like we, we've all been on different journeys, but we sort of go through the same process as you arrive here. That's exciting to me. Yeah. I, I think it's very yeah. exciting. In fact, it's, it's part of my worldview of just how much change I see in my lifetime among large numbers of people where their religions are concerned. And, yeah. and yes. most of it among people who have absolutely no idea what the law of attraction is, who have no idea what conscious creation is, who have never heard of all this source energy stuff. Mm-hmm. And yet they are in their own way finding through a, a variety of different routes. They're finding their way to new belief systems. And I think I, that's just so encouraging to me. I don't know how you I guys feel about that, but it's I just so yeah. encouraging to me. I feel like, the same way. Oh, wow. I mean, That's it's the most exciting part of my work. Is it? it oh, yeah. I, I agree completely. I, I that's, uh, you and I are on the same page. When, when you have people make sort of, they get there themselves, obviously through the, the tools you give them. Uh, that's the most rewarding part when you literally see people change everything, their whole environment changes. The people around them change because right. they have to respond to this person differently. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's just, it, it's like sending ripples out. Like, you know, the, the, the kid we were talking about earlier, Marcus, you know, he, he's changing the world. We, I mean, he certainly changed his world. Um, right. the young, the, the young man that became the x-ray technician is in the process of being a doctor now at the University of Texas. You, 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 you have, those are ripples that are altering the world forever in, in many different directions. You can never predict. So I, everybody has those stories and it, it, it excites me to be able to, that's why the best job in the world. I, I, I get to literally do this all day. Um, you know, I, it, you, you, you just, it, I can't believe that I've been so blessed to, to, to live a life. And I get to do this for a living. I make really good money. I have the life I want to live. And, uh, mm-hmm. it, 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 I owe it all to sort of this concept of I'm in charge of all this and, and through, through the way I think and feel. Hey, Monique, you, uh, went through the, uh, uh, experience a couple of weeks ago with the, uh, the, the storm that came through Houston, which of course threw Texas for a loop because they aren't used to that kind of weather. And, yeah, uh, it, it, it threw the whole, uh, electrical system out of whack. Uh, you guys were dealing with, uh, rolling outages and so forth. I'm curious because Texas is certainly part of what we might describe as the Bible belt. From your yes. perspective, what do you think how, how did all of this play out in the, in not, there's, there's not a single mindset. So I don't like the way I was starting to ask that question, but in the various mindsets of people who live in the area, how, how was it playing out from their spiritual perspectives? Do you think, I mean, what, what, how was this, what, was this like a, a reinforcement of what they had always believed? Was this something that was shifting things around? How, how was it affecting people from a mental spiritual perspective? I personally think that, 
when you have a group of people who all collectively believe or collectively are fearful, collectively um, have a negative mindset or thought process, right? I believe collectively that affects people. It expands out. So if I'm in the household, my daughter's in the household, a few other people, and we're all scared, right? And the few times we do get a chance to talk to somebody else or we do get a chance to see what's on the news, right? Kind of like the whole coronavirus thing, right? It just exploded because, the, in my opinion, the media had all this fear mongering going around. Not that it's not real. Not that people haven't, you know, passed away, unfortunately. Not none of that. I'm not discrediting it at all as a serious virus. But what I am talking about is when people have like this mass hysteria kind of thing, right? Yes, there was a lot of ice. Yes, there, we had some snow. But it's not like Texas had never had snow or ice before. Unfortunately, um, what was not common was the power outage and the way that it was handled. And because of the way that it was handled, I think people um, responded in a, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God kind of thing. And it just spread because every news story that you saw was literally somebody, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, right? Or the grocery stores are out of food. What are we going <laughs> to The whole kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So spiritually or, or from a spiritual concept, I believe that that's what made it sort of kind of larger than life because you asked me about it. And what did I tell you? I was the complete opposite. All I could think about is, God, thank you. I'm so grateful that even though it's 16 degrees outside, it's literally almost 60 degrees still in our apartment and we're not freezing to death, right? No, we can't flush the toilet for four days, <laughs> but this is not the end of the world, right? We're still okay for the most part. So I think a lot of it is just people's mindset and their perspective. We've talked about that too. What do you think about that, Joel? Even though you may not have been here experiencing it. Well, I, I, I completely, everything you said, and not shockingly, it's completely in tune with what I believe. Uh, the, the, the fear we give something, the energy we give it, the collective energy can amplify it as well. And you, you know, the, the, I'm not, a, I don't want, Walt will tell you, I don't watch any news. I literally watch no news. I, I watch. Yeah. Nothing. I don't and, either. And, and, yeah. 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 It's, it's, I don't it's, even have cable. Haven't for 10 yeah, years. Yeah. And so it, all it does is, is you, 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 the, it's called programming for a reason. They oh, literally yes. are programming your brain. So, and, and, and the, and the most effective way, Walt's a political science major. Um, and, he will, he will tell you that, that fear, fear in campaigns is, you know, that there's science behind that. And, yeah. you know, so, you know, that, that's how it, there is not a positive campaign anymore. It's who could scare you the most. And, yes. and, 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 and how that unique candidate can protect you. And same thing, down in, you know, Texas. And, and, and again, I'll, I'll, my, my thoughts and prayers do go out to all that. I mean, it, it's not that this isn't a serious problem. That's not what right. you're saying. It, right. It's the con, it's the concept that, the collective nature of it all, we, 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 you know, the doom and gloom perpetuates it to a higher degree. Mm -hmm. Um, my son that Justin that I mentioned to you earlier, um, when he first moved in, the, the, we get report weather reports again, we're in central Virginia, but you know, you'll, the news always makes things worse. You know, we had like a hurricane coming our way. Well, mm -hmm. we're in the middle of Virginia. I'm not really worried about hurricane, but right. it, it, it's not it, like you're on the coast. It, yeah, yeah. I grew up in Florida on the coast, so I know what that is. But, but so anyway, so he's, he, he kept saying, dad, do we have an evacuation plan or do we have an emergency plan is what he kept asking. Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, yeah, we got one. And, um, so finally one day he's really frustrated. He's only like 11. He goes, dad, I need to know our emergency plan, all this stuff. And I said, okay, if something comes here, we're going to get our car and we're going to leave. He goes, well, that's not much of an emergency. <laughs> I, said, I said, well, just go to another place. I said, we got a house on the beach. We'll go down to Florida and hang out on the beach for a month or two. I don't, so what does it matter? Right. We're good. And, right. and, 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 and now he's 
again, he's now 15 and certainly he's learned me and he laughs at, at anything like that now, but, but, but that is my contingency plan. Yeah. If we're alive, we'll just keep moving on. Uh, <laughs> I'll deal with it as it comes up. And like you're right. saying, you can look at what's wrong, but in, in the, in the power, this is, I've always bring the power of now into this concept of sort of the, you know, that right now in this moment, no matter how bad, the, if you're alive and you're breathing and you, you, you're not starving to death, it, Right now, this moment, we're okay. And, yeah. and, 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 and that, that's all you can do and get through it. And then, and then you take the lesson instead of, you know, running around trying to figure out, okay, look, we need to really step up our power grid, Texas. We got to figure this out. And, and, right. and, and without all these hearings, you know, it's real simple. Elon Musk can literally <laughs> put, you know, satellites and, and cars in the orbit and surely you can figure out how to keep Texas electricity off. Right. So, you know, yeah. Maybe so, I need to talk to Elon. Well, I'm sure he, he's, he's living in Texas now, so maybe he'll, he will solve it for him, but I, right. trust me, he could. So, but, 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 but that's exactly right. And, and, and I think when people sort of hear that uh, alternative narrative that you just spoke of, there's a tendency to say, oh, she's one of those anti-coronavirus people. And it's not, no, that's not what you're saying. Right. Coronavirus is real. It's the, real. The, 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 it's real. And, and, and you, you know, I'm getting, you know, I'm taking the precautions that are necessary me for me too. and my family and all that. So I'm not minimalizing it, but you can't every day wake up fearing getting the coronavirus. You, right. you, you, you take the precautions you can. And I have a, you know, sort of a double edge. I'm incredibly healthy. I've not been sick in, in probably four years Me other either. than a cold or something like that. And if I were to get it, I have zero doubt. I'm, I would dismiss it. It would, it would not, I, I just not want to, that's me. That's not saying that somebody that got it is weak or weak minded. I'm just saying for me, right. I, I haven't had the flu in 15 years. So. I'm not going to likely get the coronavirus. And if I were, I got an incredible immune system that would kick its butt really quick. Yeah. And, it, and, and living that, and I'm, and while simultaneously, you know, I have a very safe vehicle, but you know, I, I don't drive 190 miles an hour on curves. So, right. you know, so, uh, it, you know, I, with, with living within, there is a certain amount of caution. And, and when I say caution, just being aware of safety, but. This is the, the, the awakening that we're starting to realize that when you, what you focus on, you attract. And, yes. you know, you, that, that's just the bottom line. And when every day, and this was so telling in the beginning of the coronavirus, they had the, the countdown to how many people died or how many every day, mm-hmm. 48,000 people died and blah, blah. Now, they didn't mention not, you know, 3,742,000 have had the virus and cleared it. They didn't mention right. That. No, they're yeah. not going to yeah. tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> it doesn't sell. And then, and then all of the, you know, it's like these number of people died or the highest increase or all this other stuff. And it's like, no, no, you're not, you're not reporting it fairly because you, you put the focus on, you know, it is a very survivable for not everyone, but for a lot of people, right. it is very survivable. And, and so let, let's put the a right amount of energy into it, but there's somewhere between zero attention to it and a hundred percent attention to it. You know, and there's somewhere in there that's a healthy percentage of attention to it. I'm aware it exists. I need, I'm in the gym every day of my life. So I wash my hands Me too. Um, I, I, multiple times. One, one thing I also noticed that, you know, when I, I don't, I, when I say I don't get sick, I don't count little silly cold and stuff like where you get stopped up. And, you know, nobody's getting the flu this year because our safety, you know, one good thing is coming. people are wiping down their stuff better. People are doing. So, mm-hmm. you know, the idea that it does work when you, you try, you know, you try to uh, just take the most basic precautions, but just living, living a fear-based existence invites more things to be fearful of. And, you know, it's just, it, unfortunately, it's a very, uh, it, it's pervasive in our society and, and the media and our politics. Um, you know, no matter which media you turn into, they're, they're, they're making you scared about the other side. And, right. and it, it, it just, it's just the way they do it. And there's nobody really say, saying what we're going to do for you as much as they're saying is what those people are going to do. And they're going to run your life. They're going to take your guns away or your right to be this or your right to be that. It's just, there's so many things. They're just not true. Right. One of the things we talked about a lot, Joel, is whenever we did these shows, how quickly the hour goes by. And it did it once again. Oh, I, really? Oh, wow, it did. 
I mean, I know, it's just yeah. slow. <laughs> Which shows how much we're into it and how high the vibe is. We don't even pay attention to it. But yeah, we just we just blew through another hour and it was a wonderful wow. hour. Yeah. Yeah, it was. But so all this means is that Joel, you're gonna have to keep checking your schedule and finding more times to come by and visit us again. That's all there Definitely. is. Definitely. I will. Monique, it was so nice to meet you. Thank you for allowing me to sit there today. The pleasure was all mine. Anytime, please come back. Absolutely. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank but, you, Walt. We, we we love having you, Joel, and and uh, keep doing all the good stuff you're doing, man. You're just you're 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 one of my favorite people in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. Good to see. You. I got to get on the road, but it's good to see you. Thank you. All right, all catch right. you later. Have and a good Monique, day. Monique, what do you think? I mean, did I did I undersell him? I mean, come on, let's be honest. <laughs> you did. <laughs> did you I? did undersell him for sure. You did. Well, then I'm gonna have to work on that. That's all there is to it. <laughs> he is absolutely amazing. He is one fabulous. I mean, I got to do. He was he was my co-host, my only co-host on a weekly basis for about three years. Wow, and really? So every single week, I got to have this conversation with him. Yeah, really, really good. So story. lucky. Well, that's why I keep inviting him back, and that's why I keep having people like you come on. I'm lucky. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm, so, I'm lucky in so many different ways. The luck just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. Yeah, I love it. You're it's attracting so it. I am. Thank you for being the person I attracted. I appreciate that. Ah, I'm glad you attracted me too. I'm glad as well. Absolutely. I love being here every week. This is amazing. You have some really great guests. Last week. Wonderful people. With Dean and then this week with Joel. And it just keeps getting better and better and better. It does. Tomorrow you'll be with um, Dan. Daniel. Yep. Dan Mangata tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you're going to be dropping by next Monday, maybe. Is that yes. a possibility? All right. Yes. Because yes. Louie and Amy, they were already ready for you. I mean, they're all set. <laughs> well, tell know? them to get ready because this Monday, yes, definitely. Okay. They're, I'm well, they're, they're, they, they have everything lined up. I mean, as soon as I even mentioned it, they were like, oh, yeah, and they started telling me all this <laughs> stuff and so forth. So, yeah, it's going to be good. All right. Awesome. We're, we're like two minutes over, and PRN doesn't like that. This, this goes on PRN, so I'm going to have to stop right here. But thank you very much, Monique, and thank you very much to our live streamers, and especially thank you to our podcast listeners as well. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, guys.